Long-term relationships, people tend to have sex one to three times a month. <gasps> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again. Although I think we probably will excuse the fellas. I don't think you guys are going to find this that interesting. In fact, just so it's really comfortable for all the ladies. Ladies, move in. Fellas, we'll see you later. Uh, we have a return guest today. This is Dr. Kelly Casperson, and she was on our show once before where we talked about um, bladder function and and all the lady parts. Yeah, and, and hormones. And hormones, totally. Yeah. And a it, it, fascinating discussion because in that, we I really realize it's so many things like I never learned in school and you just don't necessarily talk about with your girlfriends and your general practitioner doesn't know these things or maybe you've been with them for so long you're a little uncomfortable to ask them or or even your OBGYN, you know? So it was an eye-opening conversation that led to so many more questions about sex. Um, but not the kind of things you, like it's the kind of things, the questions I got were things where it's like, I, I don't know who to ask this to because it's a little embarrassing and I don't know why. And Kelly, you were like, oh, bring me back on. Let's do this. Yeah. More sex, more sex for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so let's like get the elephant out of the room or whatever. And um, can you just like say all the words that everyone's super uncomfortable to say so that we just get them out on the table? Yes. Clitoris. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we have to say the, 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 it's a common language though, right? Like if we don't say the right body parts or the right thing, we don't know what we're talking about. Right. So that's why it's always just nice to talk about like this is how if you're going to talk to your doctor about it like my clitoris hurts my clitoris feels numb my clitoris you know where is it just you know kind of getting used to talking about it in in a way yeah. so that we can be like okay it's kind of like you know a little bit more like talking about the weather of like it's this is such an important part of almost everybody's life and yet like we still struggle to talk about it which yeah. just shows we, we say oh, we down do. there um, down there you know, so I just want to reference so that we don't recap all of that, but I want to reference that you should go back and listen to the episode. Let me see what episode number it was that we did with Kelly, because that was a really important one because we went through the anatomy. Oh, episode 754, your bladder and your lady parts, maybe shrinking. <laughs> that was a yeah. little title. Um, and, and that's a really important one because we did go through like the anatomy and so many things that we've been labeling or call, giving them the wrong description like just calling everything the vagina calling everything the vagina. oprah just got called out because oprah called a, a vulvar wash a vagina wash ah. so she got called out by the experts of like we call everything the vagina the vagina is the inside part yeah. yeah okay so let me just get to these questions if i can and and a uh, little warning if you've got kids in the room i guess you know you're the parent you should probably figure out if it's appropriate time for them to hear this or not um we are going to talk a, little, a lot about sex and we're but we're also going to talk about the anatomy so it feels like these are also things you should be having a conversation with your daughter and maybe your son about i don't know uh but you know just a warning that we're, we're going to speak graphically and we're going to answer your questions rapid fire as they've come into me on social media the number one question i got and um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this, maybe kind of in a broad sense, but so many women said, why do I, why is sex painful? But no, not one of those questions said where they feel pain. So as a doctor, right. would that be your first question? Yeah. Yeah. I get, I spend a lot of time getting very specific, right? Because again, it starts down there, right? Yeah. And that could be like. That could be your clitoris, your labia, inside the vagina. I always try to break down, is it just on penetration, which tells me more vulva entry. And if I, if I use my hand as a vulva for YouTubers, that six o'clock gets really tight and dry after menopause. Mm. It's just kind mm. of a, I call it a pain point for the vulva. So is it on penetration or is it deep, right? Is it deep? Oh, he hits the cervix um, or I have scar tissue there because I've had, you know, pelvic surgery. So you get very specific about it because it might be muscles, it might be skin, it might be scar tissue to figure out, you know, where we should target. Number one, pain with sex is never normal. It's never okay. Mm. Um, but the studies say, what is it, like 20% of women have pain with sex, which is a huge percentage. And if we look at like, why don't I desire sex? If it's painful, we're definitely not going to desire it. We got to get to the root of the pain first. For sure. So that's the first thing is to identify where the pain is. Mm -hmm. And do you hear that it is more common for women who are perimenopausal or experiencing a hormonal change? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. General urinary symptoms of menopause or GSM is vulvar and vaginal dryness. It skyrockets and it doesn't happen like 12 months after you last had a period. That's the definition of when menopause starts. But really, these changes start slowly. You can experience it and still be having periods, or it can be years after you've had a period. And I think that's what's so confusing about women because they're like, I haven't gone through menopause yet, or menopause was five years ago. How is this a menopause change? And it's really kind of the slow changes to the skin that happens because we lose our estrogen. And what about that pain that women feel like internally? Because quite a few women said, I have pain in certain positions. Mm -hmm. And yep. it was kind of different. Like some people was like, you know, whatever. They listed the position that makes them uncomfortable. Is that the position of the cervix? It could be for the, for, unless you're really, really aroused, hitting the cervix is actually can be very painful kind of normally. It's just a part of the body that it wasn't really designed all the time to feel pleasure, right? So sometimes I say, well, just hitting the cervix forcefully can be cause pain, mm. but sometimes it can be, you know, position or the other thing we don't pay attention to is like size discrepancy. We have very small women and some very large men and like sometimes the anatomy just doesn't always match up. So you just have to kind of acknowledge it's not always your fault. You might have an above average human you're playing with and then just work on <laughs> work on positions that are comfortable. Lube is always our friend. Lube is always the answer. Let me, the first ask, thing, let, me let me tag on that one real quick then because quite a few women asked, is there a, a safe lube? Is there a lube that you would recommend? Is I love it. Yeah, I'm not, uh, they do not pay me, they should, because I said this is my first answer every single time. Uber Lube is silicone based. It's very clean. It doesn't have any scents. It doesn't have any artificial colors. It's very clean. Triathletes actually use it for like chafing in the armpits and crotch. Um, and I think especially in that perimenopause, postmenopause vulva where dryness it, it tends to be more dry, silicone doesn't just get absorbed by dry skin, right? Which is what a water-based lube does. So the silicone tends to just stay there longer. Um, caution with using it with silicone toys. They always say don't, but I, you're, uh, you probably won't wreck your toys with it. Uh, uh, but they always recommend a water-based with, with silicone, silicone and silicone. But I like silicone lubrication for that perimenopause, postmenopause. It just sticks around a lot longer. Very slippery when wet. Caution in the bathroom. Oh, very, good to know. Very, very slippery. <laughs> um, another person asked, um, how do I use lube without offending my husband because he really thinks that this is just me not being turned on by him. Ah, this, so this is, I mean, this starts getting into the root of like, when we don't communicate, this is what we all assume, right? Mm -hmm. the, cl the clitoris is not a self-lubricating organ. The penis is not a self-lubricating organ. We need lubrication in order to have pleasure with friction and not pain with friction. Yeah. Right? So part of that's just basic education. This shows me, this question shows me the male doesn't understand how the female body works, right? Yeah. And so here she is trying to behave in a certain way just because she doesn't, he doesn't have the education. So part mm -hmm. of her job is to educate him. He doesn't have her body, mm -hmm. right? This is how my vulva works. This is how my vagina works. This is what I've noticed is happening more around menopause or after menopause for me. Um, but very, very common to want sex, but not be turned on. Mm. And a lot of women need either a lot of foreplay, vibration. What, can you make that distinction? Yeah, yeah. So they call it arousal desire mismatch. It's actually a thing. Okay. And so think of it, a good, a classic example is your seventh grade boy in homeroom gets an erection. Okay. Right? So he has an erection, but he is not interested in sex at all. So arousal at desire that moment mismatch. anyways <laughs> at that moment yep so arousal desire mismatch so she might be like yeah i totally want to have sex with you i'm just not that wet down there right now so you can either add lube or you can do the arousal necessary but again bodies are different we all make different amounts of lubrication that's why lube's everybody's friend and if you just say lube's part of having great sex just an ingredient to help people yeah have great sex so is that love she that could apply beforehand and i mean if she's just not comfortable having that yeah, conversation with them yeah you can you can just be like you know what it's winter time it's december my skin's really dry my vulva mm -hmm. just needs a little bit more moisture yeah so it, it's an option um you can apply it again a guy is going to have to be comfortable with this apply it to the penis apply it to the toys but it's just again if she has pain she's not going to want to have sex so he clear to me i'm like if he knew this helped her want to have sex more and enjoy herself more be all about the loop Right, right. About the loop. <laughs> and, and I think the other Great thing is, phrase. that's why I love this question so much, because you can dig into it of like, he thinks her being wet means she's into sex. But again, we know yeah. she can want sex and be have dry skin. 
she can have sex and just not have a lot of you know moisture down there so there's so much to that question i love it but yeah education's key okay um i am 52 years old and i have absolutely zero libido where do i start i never have had high libido um you're not broken Again, name of my podcast, because women just need to know they're not broken. We get told by society, you should just want sex all the time in this long-term relationship that you're in, and you should just desire like a light switch. We just get taught that, and it's simply not how our reality is for a lot of people. Some people have high desires. God bless them. Some people don't. God bless them. We're all just human, right? So that's the first thing. of Your desire is yours, and it's fine. Yeah. First step, I think, is the sex that you're having, make sure it's about you, it's for you, and you like it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're having, you know, duty sex or just to make him happy sex or get it over with sex, you, there is no desire there. You really have to make the experience be joyful and it's got to hit those dopamine receptors, right? And if it doesn't hit those dopamine receptors, you're not going to want it or crave it in the future. So it's really, I like to turn it on its end. Instead of getting your desire to rise, get that enjoyable sex to rise. The desire for it will go up naturally. And that's what a lot of kind of sex experts talk about. They're like, work on the sex desire for it will come. And that's so much easier said than done, especially if this person has been in a relationship with her partner for who knows, 30 years maybe. Yep. And they've never had that discussion. There, There's a habit, there's routine when it comes to sex and expectations, et cetera. Um, th that lack of communication becomes uh, a habit. So is there is there a book or a place you would suggest women who just don't even really truly give themselves permission to experience pleasure, don't give themselves permission to, to ask for what they need or to communicate what it is they want. Yeah. Um, Reclaiming Desire by Barry McCarthy is excellent. Okay. He can, again, he t and it's good for men and women. There's stuff in there for erectile dysfunction and male low desire also, because both men and women want more desire. Uh, women, we kind of stereotype women are the ones but we know that about a third of relationships the man has the lower desire and just realize in any relationship we've got likes and dislikes of two different people that we're trying to marry into you know a plan that works mm. so like i like to eat out at restaurants every night he likes to cook okay well can we find something that makes us happy you know in our home even when my bladder feels empty it feels like i'm going to urinate when i have an orgasm that's what someone said Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, might just be how your body is. Um, might be some women squirt, right? So they do release some fluid and you might be feeling that. That might be what's going on. Um, if you're more of, I'm just kind of guessing but saying sure. there's different scenarios. If you get, you know, that perimenopause, postmenopause, the bladder does tend to get a little more urgency or overactive bladder because of low estrogen. So that could be what's going on. So uh, an estrogen supplement there or talking yep, to? The, yep, okay. vaginal estrogen which we talked about in that previous episode. So go back and check that out. If you have a hunch, that could be what's going on there. Yep. Can we talk about squirting for a second? Because that is something I wasn't expecting to get so many questions about. Yeah. Um, I didn't know it was so common. And so let me give you like kind of a rundown of some of the questions. Yeah. Some women said, how come I can only squirt in this position? I don't know anything about it. So I don't know if, is that more enjoyable? I have no idea. Um, and other, a couple of other things were, um, I, I was a squirter with my past husband, but I'm not with this husband. Why? Yeah. So squirting is a, it's, first of all, it's super trendy right now. Like people are like selling classes on learn how to squirt. It's kind of like, a, you know, it's, I don't know, trendy, but huh. some women squirt. I just did a podcast episode on this with Dr. Teresa Wood, who knows a lot about squirting. Um, so there's one, one reference for you, okay. but if, you're either a squirter or you're not, and everybody's okay. It's just how your body works. But some women will release a large amount of fluid. Ah. Maybe it has a little bit of urine in it. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's more like the prostate. There's not a lot of studies on squirting, right? So it's kind of hard to know for sure. But um, a lot of people say, well, who cares what it is? If it feels fantastic, we don't care what it is. So for the women that do squirt, does is their orgasm different when they do squirt versus when they don't? For, for some people. And the other thing is some women can squirt and it's not related to an orgasm. It's more related to kind of an upward pressure on the anterior vaginal wall, which is where the prostate is in, in men. 
right? And so that's where a woman's prostate, we have a very, very small amount of cells that could be a prostate, depends upon who you ask. But basically where the urethra is on the anterior vaginal wall, stroking that and sometimes stroking it forcefully, it can cause the release of all that fluid. It's described to be very, very pleasurable for the female. Oh. It's not, there's nothing wrong with you if you squirt, there's nothing wrong with you if you don't squirt. Um, if you actually want to see squirting, that's not you know, porno movies, mm -hmm. if you're just kind mm -hmm. of curious about like techniques for it, omgyes.com is an amazing resource. They basically have researched like over 20,000 women between the ages of 18 and 95. The whole point of this website is to help women have more pleasure, more orgasm. Again, kind of leveling that orgasm inequality in heterosexual relationships. So yeah. OMG, yes, they have a whole section in videos on squirting. You can check it out. That isn't porn. That is important. Got it. Educational. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, again, a really overwhelmingly common question. So many women want to know if there's something wrong with them that they can't have an orgasm at all or they can't have an orgasm with uh, vaginal sex that doesn't involve clitoris um, stimulation. Yeah, so the, the vagina doesn't cause our orgasms, the clitoris does. And anybody who's having vaginal intercourse who has orgasms, usually there's some clitoral stimulation, either externally or the clitoris wraps around the vagina. So you're getting kind of stretch and pressure through the walls. Um, totally normal. You are normal if you're not having an orgasm from vaginal penetration alone. Totally fact, normal. Would you almost say it's abnormal for, if a woman, it's, it's more uncommon, yeah. I should it's say. It's more uncommon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and what we've done is we've said, well, it's very easy for men to have an orgasm by putting a penis in the vagina. So it must be the vagina that gives the woman the orgasm. No, her penis is the clitoris. Mm. And so we really have to kind of expand the paradigm of what heterosexual sex is to make sure everybody's having equal pleasure. But so many people, we've narrowed it so narrow into penis goes in the vagina, we feel like we're broken when our experience doesn't exist within that small, narrow window. Again, OMGS does so many different techniques for focused on female orgasm. And did you so, say it was OMG yes or OMGS? OMG, hell yes. So it's yes, Y-E-S. Yes. yes, okay, got yeah. it. That's a great one. Yeah, it's a great website. It's, and it's a nominal cost to get, to get in there. Okay, so I'm gonna ask this one, even though it makes me a little uncomfortable. Is anal sex in a long-term relationship safe for your body? And I don't know why they said long-term. I guess maybe to say, like, it's with the same partner. Yeah, or maybe they mean, like, many years of anal sex. Mm -hmm. yeah. New people have asked that question in different ways. And, and what I sense they're asking is, like, could I be uh, wrecking my own uh, digestive system or stretching things out? Those sort of things. Yeah, there, there's not a lot of research on it. Again, as far as, like, do we have data to support? But there is some data on... Uh, homosexual relationships, so men who have sex with men, the men who are the receivers, they're the ones who are kind of, I've had sex, anal sex for many, many years. They can have a little bit more muscle laxity around the anus, mm -hmm. um, which can lead to either fecal incontinence or, you know, letting, passing wind when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. There's just some data saying if you stretch your anus a lot, you might have trouble with your anus muscle. Here's what I think. Again, I think anal sex is kind of trending like squirting right now. Mm. And what the researchers are noticing is because of our video and porno world that we live in, yes. we're very performance based now. Like, I need you to squirt for me. I need you to blah, blah, blah for me. Because it's like this performance instead of a pleasure experience. So the researchers are noticing people kind of being interested in this. Mm. Um, which I'm so, again, I'm so glad that i am been married to the same guy for forever. And you don't have to be out don't there. Have to worry about the performances. Yeah, the yes, performance thing. Other than for him. Yeah, totally. So yeah, squirting, anal sex. I, I just want women to have pleasure. Don't do anything that hurts you. Speak up for what feels good. Speak up for what doesn't feel good. And anybody who's just doing something because somebody else wants to, if it gets kind of unbalanced, I think you're not going to desire sex again. Yeah. I just am surprised that so many women don't realize that they need... Um, that the majority of women need clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. And so yes. they, they've all these, like, I, I don't know that I would look forward to sex either if I wasn't always having an orgasm. Yeah, totally. You and know? then you, and then you try to fix your desire instead of fixing the thing that you're wanting to desire. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is so fascinating because you're like, you got to focus on the sex that you're having, but think about it. Like how many women or men for that matter, 
got taught about the clitoris in sex ed. It's disease and pregnancy management class. Totally. Not, not pleasure class. Totally. Yes. And how to have a baby. Um, okay. Best option, or do you suggest vaginal tightening to enhance sexual pleasure? No. Um, again, trendy, trending, Very trendy. All the reality trendy. shows are doing it. Yep very trendy um there is a role for the laser i do believe just like laser helps your skin right on your face it can help your skin so dry skin tight skin um i haven't been sexually active for a long time and it's uncomfortable so, but that's kind of again almost too tight and trying to loosen instead of it's loose and needs to be tightened in my experience the majority of men can't tell that a woman's had a baby they can't mm. tell that she it's, so it's again not usually for him it's more for her perception of like what's he thinking what must it be like and those are just our thoughts we can you know help that with just talking to him like does this feel good to you I'm, I'm self-conscious about my body ever since i had a baby you know how does it feel to you oh great it's, it's feeling wonderful. Um, now there's prolapse, right? Prolapse is kind of hernia or stretching of the vaginal walls. And that can create a very large vaginal vault that can be tightened with surgery. But again, that's more for a medical condition than for a sexual performance. Okay. So my only point of reference here is again, the reality TV shows where I've seen them go and do this. And mm -hmm. I've also seen it talked about on social media. Does it enhance a woman's experience? It can, but not in the fact that it's tightening. It can because it brings in more blood flow. It can help bring in more collagen, right? Blood flow is great for pleasure. Collagen is great for preventing pain and having good, you know, tissue quality. Um, but it tends not, I tend to shy away from like, again, our, our brain's the biggest sex organ, right? If we think yeah. it's, we're, the placebo effect is amazing in the sex studies. Like if we think this is great for our sex life, it's probably going to be great for our sex life. But does the data actually support that? Probably not. Which leads me to my next question, uh, you know, about your mindset going into it. This person asks, will I ever be able to enjoy sex again after my husband's affair? Yes, you will. But you've got to do some work. Yeah. Right? It's, again, it's the brain on that. And, and that's where we bring in sex therapists because it's like they're absolutely trained to help you figure out what about that is limiting your pleasure in sex. Right. So is it talk about sex therapists for a moment. Um, do you have people that you would recommend if they reached out to you? Could they get re a referral for a sex therapist? Yeah, so they should they should go to um, uh, what is it? It's ASECT, A-A-S-E-C-T, American Association for it's like certified sex therapists and educators. It's a mouthful. ASECT is. OK, always, we'll look that up and we'll put ASECT. that in the show notes. OK, so you um, you type in your zip code. Ah. And it'll tell you all the ASEC certified sex therapists, sex educators, sex coaches in your area. So that's that's the go to research. They're like the governing body of certified sex therapists. Is that something you would recommend people do as an individual or as a couple or maybe both? Yeah, both. You can do both or you can go as an individual and decide to bring the couple in or you can go as a couple and they're like, wait, nope, just one of you really needs to come back. So they're comfortable doing all of the above. Can you destigmatize de sex therapists? Yeah, for sex moment, therapist. I think the, the thought is like, oh, are they going to ask me a lot of uncomfortable questions? You know, like, are they going to be present in the bedroom and coach us through it? Like, that's a super common misconception because uh, my sex therapy friends, they're like, a lot of people just think we like watch people have sex. And that's not what we do at all. And I'm like, really? People think that about your job? <laughs> and so sex therapists are just therapists who are comfortable talking about sex. Which in the same way of like doctors who can help you with sex are just doctors who are actually comfortable talking about sex. So they're trained therapists, a lot work in communication, how to communicate what your needs are, how to find out what you like, you know, how to go about figuring out a sex life that works for you. So just kind of talking about that in a, there's, a, it's amazing how many marriage and family therapists still aren't cool or comfortable talking about sex. Wow. And sex you know, is what, huge in, in marriages. Absolutely. And it can be such an important piece that people are just okay with it not being there or happening very infrequently. And it can just bring so much more enjoyment to your relationship. But I also think that there is this um, kind of a, because so many people have experienced uh, sexual traumas and childhood sexual abuse that I always wonder, be, because that number's so high, that has to affect people's sex life. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think this last, I was just reading about this. It's like one in four people have suffered abuse, 
of, mm. of whatever, so however you want to d define that. And so it's like to think that you'll never have great sex is not true because we have many, many people who've been through really bad things who have great sex lives. Right. So it doesn't mean you can't have a great sex life. It might mean you need some tools. You need to talk it through. You need to figure out where your hangups are. But it's yeah. absolutely possible to have great. Again, sex is about you. It's about you and pleasure and enjoying life. So it's like, why wouldn't you want to try to have as much joy in that arena as you can? And I think for so many um, cultures, and sometimes maybe the way you were raised, or even in your own household, uh, sex can be made to seen as something that's dirty, something that's bad, you know, and, and having conversations with friends who were raised in a very, very um, religious household, where, you know, sex is bad, period, end of subject, unless you're trying to procreate, and then mm -hmm. they get married, but they've been uh, conditioned for, you know, 20 some odd years that this is bad. And then yeah. how do you flip that switch that they're like, oh, I have this piece of paper, so now it's good. Yeah, I know. It's a mind trip for sure. And I think people are just, you know, the ones who are successful and have happy sex lives. And because I talk to people all the time, they're raised in this very strict conservative culture where it's exactly as you describe. And now they have great sex lives. They realize they're like, my religion's incredibly important to me. But so is this part of my relationship and these thoughts just don't serve me anymore mm. and being able to piece apart what thoughts aren't serving me anymore and what do i need to to change to have a happy sex life okay so the next question is someone who says i've been doing hormone replacement therapy and it hasn't helped my sex drive at all help yep um so my question would be is testosterone involved in that because a lot of hormone replacement therapy isn't it's just estrogen progesterone and estrogen really does help a lot of people with their sex life mostly because it helps the menopause symptoms of fatigue anxiety sleep hot flashes if you have that going on you're not going to want to have sex right right so just giving you estrogen to help the menopause symptoms can improve your sex life but estrogen itself isn't really the hormone of desire testosterone is and testosterone also goes down as years past menopause go on so one way to use testosterone really the only way and it's still off label not fda approved but sex uh, doctors are comfortable with it is giving women a level of testosterone which is still in the realm of female but just gives them what they had say when they were 30 and ex instead of when they're 55. Mm -hmm. Right. So testosterone is the hormone of desire. If you then take testosterone and you still don't have the desire you want, now we got to work on your sex, right? What's mm -hmm. the relationship? What's the sex you're having? Are you making time in your life for pleasure in general? Are you, you know, mm. are you paying attention to the clitoris, all these other pieces? Because I think where people get tripped up is they're like, just give me the hormone to have amazing sex. And it's like, you can, ha there's plenty of people with great, you know, normal hormones with crappy sex lives. So it's not always yeah. just a one. And is it so much more mental for women than it is for men? Yes and no. I, th I think men really do get hung up. Again, middle age, when their testosterone starts going down, penises really start to have trouble with erections, right? And then they realize, whoa, pleasure and arousal really is important because it isn't the light switch that it was when they were 20. So I think it's so automatic early on for men that it, they can kind of get tripped up and not know what to do when they actually have to do a little bit more work like women in you know that age group do so i don't know if that answered your question but yeah it's all about the brain more so for women for, for me it just seems like it is i mean i'm only speaking anecdotally i don't but... i don't know i don't I, I don't think i've seen that it's more but think of how society tells men that sex is okay right like men just they're yeah you're allowed to be a sexual being you're allowed to go get some you're allowed to enjoy it like maybe it's just easier for them because they just get told it's easier for them yeah Okay, so I, I don't know if you can answer this one, but the person wants to know if it's a problem that neither they or their partner have a real desire for sex. And so when I read that, my first thought was, I wonder if, in fact, that is how he feels. Yeah. yeah or, or if they're both just like, she, you know, obviously she says she, she, doesn't, she doesn't care about it and he doesn't seem to mind. I would say that's probably... That could be a more common scenario like because couples just don't talk about sex so then we just mm -hmm. assume we like layer cake assume things right yeah. so she's like well he doesn't pursue me so he, that must mean he has a low desire do we actually know that did we ask him 
or is she assuming it? So you're yeah. already starting to think like a sex therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But if, but if both people in the relationship don't have sex as a very important part and they're both very happy with it, that's fine. It's all about the relationship and what works for the relationship. This person, I think they're bragging, but they said, my sex drive is through the roof. I can never get enough. Is that bad? I think it's only bad if it hurts, you know, if is it hurting somebody? Is it hurting you? Is it hurting the person you're with as far as like, I can't work, I can't sleep, I, you know, like, is it becoming a destructive force in your life? Or is it bringing you joy? Is it bringing your partner joy? Mm. I think about that more than good or bad. Good or bad's oversimplifying how complex this stuff is. Yeah. And also, I think once something becomes very disruptive, uh, like exercise is a good thing unless it is has overtaken your life and it's your every thought and now it's interrupting your ideas of you know meeting with friends or you've got a cold and you shouldn't exercise and you're beating yourself up that then it's a problem and yep. you should probably talk to somebody about that exactly totally um this person wants to know if it's or why it is that they can only have an orgasm when they're on top oh it's probably angles and friction so Just maybe experiment with toys yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love it. You know, they get, it goes into that performance. Like, well, I've got to be able to experience an orgasm in every room, in every position, in the shower, in the hot tub. And it's like, well, no, just have fun. Know what works best for you. Like experiment if you want to. Yeah. But, you know, when people kind of beat themselves up of like, my body only works this way. It's like, oh, it's great. You're having an orgasm in that position. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, quite a few women asked why their the scent changes for them after childbirth and or after menopause. Are they saying this like the smell of their vulva and vagina? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'm like, does it is it how he smells? Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, after childbirth, your vagina just had all of it, the uterine contents go through it, right? The the uterus is still healing. There's so much going on down there. Um, plus, you have low estrogen because if you're breastfeeding, you have low estrogen, high prolactin, which mm -hmm. is another reason that sex is painful and dry right after childbirth. Um, so hormones there, and then post-menopause, we have drier skin. We don't, we have, a, the pH of our vagina actually changes when we lose our estrogen, which is really important for many reasons. Number one, it prevents urinary tract infections by having a, an acidic pH. Yes. And so we add estrogen back in in women who get recurrent UTIs to reacidify the vagina, which fights the E. coli and stuff like that. So your pH is legitimately changing because of low estrogen, which I would think can affect the smell, your, you know, your biome, your microbiome changes. Yeah. So that's probably what happens. And I just don't think many people um, are comfortable talking about that for whatever reason, but they should be. And as we, you might want to go back again and reference that prior podcast that we did together, um, because we talked a lot about that and the common uh, complaint that so many women have about UTIs and just bladder pain, et cetera, and how, how commonly that is related to their estrogen levels. Yep. Yep. So as far as smell, I would say like, if it's a foul discharge, go get checked out, rule out an infection. But if you're like, hey, this is just kind of what's happening to my body at this stage of my life. And if it's not causing you like itching, burning, pain, stuff like that, it might just be normal changes. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people ask, and I, I think I know your, what your answer is going to be, but quite a few women asked, um, what is the right amount of, what, how much sex should I, should, should I be having? What's the average? Yeah. Like they're very concerned with like, are we doing it enough? I know. Again, we're performance based, right? Yeah. Like this is what our society has come to of like, how do I measure up against all other humans? It's like, that's not what sex is about, you guys. It's not, there's not an Olympics to be run here. Yeah. So I always shy, like I know the data, but I shy away from, because I think, you know, it's like eight hours of sleep, 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, eight fruits and vegetables, sex two to three times a week. Like it gets into that like checklist to do. And once totally. you start checklist to doing sex, don't wonder where your desire went. Yeah went away because you just made it a to-do list totally um the uh, long-term relationships people tend to have sex one to three times a month a lot more some less they, they actually do because you have to define this stuff if you want to research wow. it right so like a yeah. sexless marriage is less than twice a month wow. low sex to sexless marriage wow so, okay 
that's considered sexless. I sexless. thought sexless meant you just you hadn't had sex in whatever years, months, weeks. Well, they, yeah, they have to define it, right? When you're going to research people, you have to like figure mm -hmm. out if they so they define it. Yeah, um, that's kind but of, yeah, the, the, I, don't, I certainly don't want to make anyone feel guilty or bad, but it's just for me, I can't imagine um, being in a long term relationship with somebody and not being able to enjoy that part of your relationship. Yeah, it's in, it's incredibly I would do some important. Work. I would, I would do something yeah. about that. But I mean, the, look at where so many women are in their life, though. They've got kids at home, maybe a newborn. They're at Ugh. school or they've got a job. Is like, we are busy, busy, busy people. And like you said, you have to bring intention into it. Like, this is if you want a healthy sex life to be part of your life, you've got to yeah. block away time for it. Yes. And make space for it. And it has to be like, not in that cortisol, go, go, go checklist brain, but in the like, receiving loving oh and you have to like allow your body to switch back and forth right yeah and so it, it, I, I never want to especially like my young moms who are working oh, totally. like i never want to tell them how much to have sex yeah Be like you just do what you need to do at this point and know that when you have more time bring it into your life more that's right that's right. That's great. I, and I love that advice too. I mean, because so many, again, so many of the comments were from young moms who are like, I am exhausted and I'm a little resentful. And those two things just don't do much for desire. Yeah. Totally. You know, if you feel put up, if you feel like, oh, I'm having to get the kids ready for bed or whatever, maybe it's him. But, you know, my comments today were mainly from, from women, especially the young women who were just like, I, I just feel like, I don't want one more person who I have to do something for them that needs my body and needs me. I just want to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, especially for the men listening of like communicating, right? Cause he's like, now she's rejecting me cause he feels rejected sexually. And she's like, I don't have one more thing to give. And you're the thing that doesn't die if I neglect it. Right. True. So, so it's realizing and talking like, what does sex mean to you right now? I'm not rejecting you. I love you so much. We created this baby together. I'm so touched out. My breasts are for feeding. My vagina just delivered a baby. Like I can't right now. It doesn't mean I don't love you. So it's like those, it's really a stressful time for, for couples. And it, it universally happens to couples yeah. that the, having a baby is, can be very, very challenging to sex lives. And you don't feel sexy. I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself, I didn't. So I, I just want to say to those young moms out there, it does get better. It really does. It does get better. Absolutely. And but life gets it, easier, man, when they, when they just start driving life, when one of your, if you have more than one kid, when the first kid gets their license, your life gets so much easier. Yes. You, and sleeping through the night. Huh, man. Huge. We know if you're not sleeping through the night, you do not have a sex drive. Mm. Like sex drive comes from your body being feeling well, right? Like I'm well rested. My stress is managed. I feel kind of fit and I'm eating healthy food. All yeah. that's really good for sex drives and you know, your sex life. And so when you're not sleeping, mm -mm, it's okay to not have a sex drive. Your body's just trying to survive. Well, this was amazing. It, it's great to know that we're not broken. Um, I, your podcast is fantastic. We'll put a link to that in our show notes. And also, for those people who want to reach out to you, you do Zoom consultations. Is that accurate? Yes. Well, I only see people, doctor, physician in Washington State, but I do a lot of Instagram lives where I do question and answer like this all the time. So people can DM me on Instagram. And then if you're on my email list, you get the Zoom link to my monthly live podcast recordings. And they can sign up for that on your website. Yep. Yep. Okay. This is really important. And it's, it's such a beautiful, pleasurable thing. Um, and I think if we just ignore it, and think, well, must be something is wrong with me, or like, I don't need it. You, you just could be missing out on just a really beautiful connection between you and your partner and the joy and pleasure that you deserve. Totally. And personal growth. Like I was talking to, it's like set your sexuality is like the last pillar on your personal growth journey. Like when you figure out your wow. sex life and your sexuality, like other things start going well too, like your job and your confidence and you know, all of that stuff. So it's like, it's a great personal growth to figure out your sexuality too. I love that. I love that. It's, um, it's actually true. I never thought of it that way. Well, thank you so much for being a guest here. Um, Kelly, we definitely want to have you back again because people, I mean, especially the women in my audience, we, we have a lot to learn and you are a wealth of information. I just love how you put it. Like you just don't make it weird. You don't make it awkward. It's just yeah. so chill and your approach to it makes it so much more fun and enjoyable. It's so fun to share my knowledge with people and to help them figure out how to navigate this because we don't get any education. 
right? We no. get no education. So it's my pleasure to be able to join with you today. Let's end on that. Sex education. I mean, is do they still do sex education in schools? Uh, only if your state mandates it, right? And so it's state mandated. So it's like 20 states mandate it. Of those states, only a small percentage actually have to be medically accurate. None of them mandate talking about pleasure, oh. right? So it's like, think back at your sex ed. Like we learned about the, the vagina and the uterus, not the clitoris. No, right? nothing about pleasure. Zero. Nothing about the pleasure. And so here we are thinking we're broken, but we just don't have the education. There's so much out there which just does place a stigma on it. You know, like it must be a bad thing if we're not talking about it. Yes, exactly. Well, I didn't, you know, they never taught me anything. So there, there must not be anything to know. Yeah, right. right. Well, you're amazing. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And everybody, if you're watching, please remember you can leave comments below the video. Um, I would encourage you to subscribe. You can send this send this video to your girlfriends because this is the stuff that maybe you guys aren't talking about as friends, but some questions will be answered in this series. And as always, thank you for subscribing.